late 60s on Che Guevara. Uh, they did a show called Richard Third Time, which was a reimagining of Shakespeare's Richard III uh, with Richard Nixon playing an essential figure. Um, they did a show called Chicago 70, which was in some ways a documentary recreation of the trial of the Chicago 7. It was a group of uh, yippies, actually they were, weather underground uh, people who were arrested during the Democratic Convention in 1968 and then were tried in 1970 and became a, a, a very important sort of marker in sort of the youth culture and the anti-war movement and freedom of speech in the United States. Um, uh, and Ain't Lookin', which was a, a kind of a minstrel show uh, adaptation or adaptation of a novel, which was about a barnstorming black baseball team in the late uh, late forties. Also, a number of interesting adaptations, including a successful, a successful reimagining of Dickens in Mr. Pickwick. Um, the, uh, in the eighties, the company experienced serious financial difficulty, and in the and in the late eighties, was forced to close. Um, so 10 Lost Years, as I mentioned earlier, based on a book of oral histories. Uh, it in, uh, and uh, amongst, we have three of the original company here. Among the other people involved were Jackie Burroughs, uh, uh, Ross Skeen, Peter Faulkner. Dita Pabo. Dita Pabo, uh, piano player. And, uh, Francois Régis Clanfer. Francois Régis Clanfer. Yeah. Patricia Ludwig. Patsy Ludwig, great. Uh, Rich Payne. Oh, oh, Richard Shears. Yeah. Richard Shears. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. Anyhow, uh, uh, it is, a, it is a portrait of the Great Depression and its effects upon Canada. It had a strong theatrical and, and musical presence as it views the economic catastrophe of the Depression in both personal and more national scales. There's music, humor, and some wonderful set pieces, including a, a radio broadcast section talking about the role of radio in uh, Depression society, which we just talked about this morning in second year history. Uh, and also a trip across the country on the railway. Critical response was immediate and uniformly strong. Urjo Kareda called it a kind of musical theater which is funny, insinuating, and touching. And on one of the tours, the Lethbridge Herald extolled the nationalistic aspect, called it saying, Canadian history, Canadian culture, and Canadian thought. It's not Ibsen's Norway, nor Shaw's Britain. Uh, so I think we'll leave at that point. We will move on to these people who know more about this exact active project than I do. Um, and we'll start with um, Alan Firewall to talk a little bit about the idea of collectives, then Maya to talk a little bit about directly about, uh, about George's training method, this idea of the efforts, then Cedric as the sort of one of the original originators of the idea for this particular show, and also uh, the process, some of the process of what they were trying to do, and then Alec talking about the technical aspect of trying to put something together with nothing, and then a couple of the actors and their experiences through the process. So uh, if we can sort of keep these to five to ten minutes, yeah. I know I didn't do that, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you were talking about <laughs> us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, as a, as a theatre historian, um, to my mind, ten lost years marked the pinnacle of achievement of Canadian theatre in the 20th century. <laughs> I, I'm serious about that. Mm. I think it was one of the greatest productions I've ever seen in my life. I've seen theater all around the world. I've seen great theater. I've never seen more exciting theater than I saw that first night in PWP. 10 Last Years was made possible because of the collective movement that Alex has mentioned, although George would have went to his grave insisting there was never anything collective about his work at all <laughs> and that he wasn't part of the collective <clears throat> movement, but certainly it came out of and was formed by something else that was happening in Canadian theatre at that time. In 1957, when George came back from uh, the UK to Toronto to start implementing his theatrical vision and to kind of re revive the radical theatre, which had been the tradition of theatrical modernism for the 30 years by that point, but which had become ossified into a kind of socialist realism in the 1950s, um, there were four or five professional established theater companies in Canada in that first year of funding from the Canada Council. 12 years later, there were close to 200. Something major happened in the decade in the 1960s, and it wasn't just the counterculture, although that was obviously part of it. When George Luscombe as a young man wanted to go into theater, 
He did some touring around. He got whatever work he could find, but he realized he had to go somewhere else to learn how to do it, to learn his craft. In the 1960s, the baby boom came out of school. And I guess many of us are in approximately that age uh, group up here. Our parents were the, the Depression era parents. They went from bread lines into the army and then into work. They didn't go to university by and large, but we did. And in the 60s, suddenly the first generations of theater students were graduating in this country. And it was the 60s. <laughs> and the choice seemed to be you line up to audition for Stratford or you line up to audition for the Manitoba Theatre Centre. So you practice your English accents or you practice your American accents or you get your, you know, your musical steps down. <coughs> but there were so many people coming out who wanted to do more than that. And there weren't at that point a lot of plays written by Canadians because the playwrights themselves are just kind of coming out of the schools as well. So when you have a lot of actors who want to create theater, who want to act, and there aren't a lot of plays to act, and there aren't a lot of stages to act on, there seemed to be only one real solution, and that was to make your own. And that was really the kick point for the, what has become known as the alternative theater movement. And it happened all across the country in many different ways. For many people, one of the historical marking points would be the summer of 1972, when Paul Thompson, who had also gone to Europe to kind of learn his chops, takes a group of actors to a farmhouse with tape recorders, spend the summer talking to people and putting a show together and then touring it around local communities. And I don't know if that show is familiar to you folks. It's called The Farm Show. Okay, you, you run into it? It's actually a really fun show. You should see Michael and Dachi's film of it. They will. They will. It's <laughs> uh, over the next two years, there were probably two or three hundred similar kinds of shows done across the country. In 1974, I was in a group in Newfoundland. We spent the summer in a mining town in the center of Newfoundland with tape recorders, talking to miners, putting a show together about their strikes and their history and their lives, and trained it around the, you know, the Atlantic provinces and so on. People were doing that in every part of the country. Suddenly, this had become a kind of a movement. This was the phase of collective creation. And it became a real headache for the arts councils because whereas they had started off with you know, half a dozen companies and they all knew what a company looked like. A company had a board of directors and an artistic director and it had a season and it had a publicity machine and it filled grant applications. Suddenly there were hundreds of these groups across the country popping up and saying, well, you know, we spent the summer, we put together a show and we're going to keep on doing it. Some of them became, you know, Toronto Free Theatre. You know, hippies, we're going to do free theatre. It's can stage now, you know. <laughs> but, uh, most of those companies disappeared, but kind of some stuck in. And all along, George was working his things with TWP in his own way, off the grid of that kind of evolving system, but it was coming into his theater space. And one of the key things that met there that made 10 last years possible was like the collective theaters and like George's own mentors, Ewan McCall and Joan Littlewood, this whole movement had a profound belief in the creative power of the actor. The actor as a theater maker, and not just a kind of a walking, talking mannequin, not just the interpreter of a text, but in fact, the formative principle of a text, the creator of the text. What George brought to this, and I think Maya will address this concretely, is Things like the, the farm show or the things that we did in the Mummer's Troop. You know, when it was good, it was good by accident. You know, in other words, raw talent, self-learning, right? So a lot of that stuff didn't actually get past the first, uh, the first steps. And the ones that were great really were great, but they were very unsystematic, right? It was people just trying stuff out. What George brought to it was an insistence that there is a craft in this kind of work. 
And I think that would probably be the point, which I could turn it to Mark. So I just take over. Um, I hate watching people straining. I put your necks out. I teach physical theater. I can't stand seeing a single <laughs> neck like this. So I'm, I'm going to stand so you don't. There is, and Maya, if you want to, we, we, have, we can record you even in front of the desk if yeah. you want to get the. Get okay, well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to dance. That's um, a little too close, eh? uh, I just want to, I'm not going to read from my play, but I do want to show you the, the, first, <laughs> the first page says, to my theatre mentor, the late George Lascombe. And he basically, uh, it was almost like George sat inside my brain when I decided to become a director and guided me through reminding me of some of those incredibly important disciplines of theatre. Uh, one of the things that, we ha that happens nowadays is that people get a little taste of this and a little taste of that when they're learning to be actors. But after I'd finished my British drama school training in Glasgow, Scotland, I came straight to Canada and auditioned for two theatres. One was the St. Lawrence Centre Company, and I walked into this huge kind of big, you know, barn of a place and did my little pieces. And then I went into 12 Alexander Street to do my little pieces, fell in love and didn't even look back. Um, there was such an incredible feeling of circus in this place. And I say circus because George Lascombe actually believed in the empty space, a bunch of seats for the audience and platforms to set to, to set a sort of a backdrop to the most exciting thing that you could ever look at and listen to on a stage, which was people's bodies and uh, actors. So he always thought that the most colourful and thrilling thing was the actor's body, more so even than the voice. You know, uh, in, uh, some people used to complain that actors actually in his place shouted a bit too much. <laughs> but he carefully crafted a company in some ways, you might think it was a little like the way a Commedia dell'arte company would be put together. A little taste of this kind of quality in an actor's body, and a little look here, and you know, the tall, lanky one, and the little squat one. I think I was a little squat one. Um, <laughs> and, um, and he crafted a company together, and then he trained us. And he didn't just talk at us. He forced us to go through physical training every single day believing that space was the most powerful energy that we could, that we could create. So that we actually infused our, our, the, ener the space around us with our energy. So that uh, after three, you know, well, the first month we actually, when we were auditioning for him, he started off with 60 actors and he was going to pick 12. When we, we would go every single day, work about eight hours a day, five and, and you know, five, five days a week, because they always believed there should be one day off for family time and one day off to learn your lines. <laughs> he was, and that, actually that was a wonderful, um, a wonderful principle of his. Um, and he would teach the actors to move around the space uh, so that we were all equal, uh, equidistant from one another. So we were like a flock of birds or fish in the ocean and we could turn on a dime. But in order to understand space, we basically had to do this, grilling this uh, work every single day into our bodies. He trained us in the efforts. Now, I say the efforts more than Laban because I think George interpreted Laban into his own version of the efforts. The efforts are the dynamics of speed, weight, and direction. There were eight efforts, and we all had to train grindingly through these efforts every single day, and even in rehearsals, we'd work two or three hours before starting to rehearse, um, infusing the air around us with the energy of our own bodies, starting from our pelvic centers. A lot of theater schools introduce people to the Laban, but George trained us in it so that, by, that we couldn't escape from the efforts. It was part of what we did, and it was a beautiful thing. And that's why I felt that George was inside my head when I started directing, because he taught us that you didn't actually need real substance in order to create a stage set. You created a stage setting, which is very, very different. So we never had to identify. I remember one of the wonderful things, for example, about 10 Lost Years was I think you guys, did you not use chains for the sound of the train? Because he put us through this incredible training where we all had to do a train coming from a distance and getting close and then going into the distance again. And we used boxes and chains. And it sounds like, oh, drama class. Well, George Luscombe did the real thing that drama class actually is all about and put it in front of an audience. So that was what was so incredibly important. And when you have an empty space, 
and you have a group of actors all physically trained in the details of how they're going to move without, he hated sort of habitual stuff like, you know, flicking your hair or, you know, scratching your face. Everything had to be uh, absolutely clean and precise physical movement. When you have um, that kind of uh, world that you set up with your 12 actors, sadly to say 10 men, two women often, I think uh, changed a little bit. Um, then you can go, I can do a 